Hi guys, Ramon Goose here. Today on The Guitar Show, we're going to be looking at one of the greatest guitar players ever, the amazing Andy Summers. Check it out. As a kid growing up, one of my favourite bands was always The Police. Andy Summers' guitar playing just always seemed so fresh, innovative and modern for the time. After I learnt guitar, I pretty much forgot about Andy Summers as really just one of my sort of childhood sort of favourite bands. And even though I've always enjoyed the music of The Police, I've never really thought of Andy Summers as a guitar player that I should be influenced by. So let's find out now why I think Andy Summers is one of the great guitar players of our generation and also quite possibly one of the most underrated guitar players. Andrew James Summers was born on the 31st of December 1942 in Poulton Leaf Fylde, which is a small market town close to Blackpool in Lancashire. Here's a young Andy Summers from 1963 performing with the Andy Summers Quartet at the Candlelight Club in Bournemouth. In the early 1960s, the singer and keyboard player Zoot Money and Andy Summers decided to have a crack at the big time and moved from Bournemouth to London. They eventually found a rather grotty basement flat at 11 Gunterstone Road in West Kensington. The Zoot Money band became a very popular R&B band. They passed an audition at the Flamengo Club in Wardle Street. And as their popularity grew, Dates from further afield rolled in, and soon Zoot's flat became a total music scene, the place where showbiz London would turn up night after night, and the parties would go on until 5 or 6 in the morning. Jimi Hendrix even came to 11 Gunterstone Road. It was when he first arrived in London in 1966. He went down to Andy's flat and was looking for his guitar, but as Andy was out, Zoot Money instead gave him another left-handed acoustic guitar which Jimmy took away. Andy would later get to jam with Jimi Hendrix in Los Angeles. The 60s music scene in London was a tight-knit community and most of the groups knew each other. Over time, Andy became friendly with Eric Clapton as their paths would often cross while working on the same circuit. During 1965, Andy's guitar of choice was a 1959 Sunburst Gibson Les Paul, bought from the Selma shop in Charing Cross Road for £80. At the time, with the Yardbirds, Eric was still using a Fender Telecaster, but he wanted to get his hands on a Les Paul after hearing Freddie King playing a gold top model on his album, Let's Hide and Dance Away. So Eric asked Andy where he bought his and acquired his 1960 model from the same shop. Of course, Eric went on to record the groundbreaking John Mell and the Blues Breakers album, also known as a Beano album, in the spring of 1966. And after leaving John Mayall, Eric left to form Cream with Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker. However, in the first rehearsals for his new project, the 1960 Les Paul was stolen. And by this time, Andy had moved on to a Fender Telecaster as his main guitar and sold Eric his Gibson Les Paul for £200. This was a guitar that was known as a Summer's Burst and can be heard all over Cream's debut album, which was called Fresh Cream. Zoot and Andy then formed a new band called Dantelion's Chariot and they took a big leap from being a successful R&B band in London to being an acid rock band playing long guitar solos and writing their own material. The band didn't ultimately work out and then Robert Wyatt invited Andy to join Soft Machine. Soft Machine basically lived in one house in West Dulwich 
the band Soft Machine left for a six-week run of dates that would climax with a string of shows supporting the Jimi Hendrix experience. By the time the band had hooked up with Hendrix, Andy had been ousted at the insistence of Ayers because of the bassist's unease at the direction the band was heading with Andy's guitar style pushing them further into the realms of jazz. Disappointed, Andy waited in a hotel in New York until he decided to call Zoot in California, which resulted in Andy flying out to join Zoot in the New Animals, replacing the recently sacked Vic Briggs. He arrived in time for their performance at the Newport Pop Festival. Not long after this, the band broke up. For the next five years, Andy stepped away from live performances and studied classical guitar at the University of California. He met an American lady and got married and scraped by earning a meagre living giving guitar lessons. After buying a battered and modified 1963 Fender Telecaster from one of his students for $200, he found a new lease of life and resumed a live work back in the singer-songwriter Tim Rose of Morning Dew. In November 1973, he returned to England with his girlfriend and moved into the family home in Bournemouth before relocating to London. On the 26th of October 1975, he depped for the ailing Mike Oldfield in a live rendition of Tubular Bells with the Northern Concert Orchestra conducted by David Bedford at the Newcastle City Hall. The support that night came from the last exit, a jazz fusion group fronted by a Geordie bass player called Gordon Sumner. But everyone knew him as Sting thanks to a distinctive hooped black and yellow sweater he wore making him look like a bee. The pair did not meet on that occasion, although Andy watched a few minutes of their set from the back of the hall. Two weeks later, he met Curved Air's American drummer Stuart Copeland in Newcastle. Strontium 90 was the name of a short-lived 1977 British band with members Mike Howlett on bass and vocals. Sting also on bass and vocals, Stuart Copeland on drums, and Andy on guitar. Through Strontium 90, Andy met Sting and Stuart Copeland. The band was formed in the middle of 1977 by bass player Mike Howlett after he quit Gong and recruited Sting and Summers to participate in a new project. Drummer Chris Cutler was unavailable to play drums, so Sting brought along Copeland with whom he had been playing with in an early lineup of The Police. Bassist Mike Howlett formed Strontian 90 with Sting, Stuart Copeland and Andy for a gong reunion gig at the Hippodrome in Paris on 28th of May 1977. Sting and Copeland already had their own trio called The Police with guitarist Henry Padavani and had released a single called Fallout earlier that spring. However, impressed by Andy's talent, Sting and Copeland were reluctant to lose him, so he was invited to play a couple of gigs with the band. It soon became apparent that it would never work with the two guitarists. Padovani had bags of punk attitude and looked the part, but he didn't have the chops on guitar and he was told he was out of the band by a reluctant Copeland, who had always championed the guitarist. On August the 18th, 1977, the new Police Trio performed their debut gig at Rebecca's in Birmingham, tearing through a set of Copeland written songs in 12 minutes flat. Riding on the coattails of the punk movement, where being showered with spit was a sign of appreciation. Andy, who was fast approaching his 35th birthday, was not impressed with this scene. In January 1978, Copeland's brother Miles became their manager and financed recording sessions at Surrey Sound Studios with producer Nigel Gray for what was to become their debut album, Outlandos Der Moor. The police's history of infighting is infamous. And after playing to 67,000 people at New York's Shea Stadium, Sting and Andy agreed that things couldn't get any better than this. And when the tour finally ended six months later in Australia, on the 4th of March, 1984, the police were finished as a working band. After the police, in the spring of 1984, Andy and Robert Fripp returned to Arnie's shack to record Bewitched, a second collaboration of instrumentals with an emphasis on melody over the meandering textures of its predecessor. 
Okay, guys, let's talk about Andy's gear when he was in the police. Although Andy states it's a 1961 Telecaster, this guitar is more likely in 1963. Andy states that all the modifications to this guitar were already installed on the guitar when Andy bought it. The guitar has a slim C-shaped maple neck, a Gibson PATH humbucker in the neck, and a stock tele pickup in the bridge position, which is actually mounted and screwed to the body. It also has a built-in preamp, which is controlled by an on and off switch, and a knob which adds or subtracts the gain. The preamp was added sometime in the 1970s, and at that time it was sellotaped to the back of the guitar. The outer face switch was also added, which basically reverses the polarity of the pickups. The original bridge was replaced with a brass bridge with six individual saddles. Andy says of his 61 Sunburst, I was completely down and out when I got it for $200. I was living in LA, giving guitar lessons to get by. I always remember clearly that I got that Telecaster off a kid I was teaching guitar to at the time. I offered him a chance to back out of the deal. I said, hey, do you really want to get rid of this? It's a great guitar. He said, I need the money. I really need the 200 bucks. It's just always been a beautiful playing instrument. By the time I got it, somebody had really fooled around with it and put in a Gibson humbucker in the front position and added this overdrive circuit. It had a phenomenal out of phase sound, which was great. Sadly, at the end of the tour, that pickup got knocked out, but it was still a great guitar. Physically, it had perfect ergonomics. So that became the guitar that I really used for years. I did nearly everything with the police with just that one guitar. This funky old guitar that somebody carved up and got rid of was just magic. As well as his Telecaster, he also used his red 1961 Stratocaster. Andy actually uses quite a heavy gauge on his guitar, which are 12 to 49s. At the very beginning of the birth of the police, Andy Summers' guitar rig was very sparse. To Guitar Player Magazine, he revealed I had simple tools, a Telecaster, a Fender Twin, and maybe an MXR Phase 90. The next thing I got was a chorus, became very characteristic of the police sound. I probably got up to four pedals taped to the floor before I could afford a custom Pete Cornish pedal board with a Metron and a couple of fuzz boxes, an envelope filter, chorus units, and phasers, all of which I'd combine with the Echoplex. In the very early days of the police, Andy was using just the MXR Phase 90 pedal and a reverb. If you really want to achieve Andy's sound with a police, you're going to need a Maestro Echoplex tape delay and an Electro Harmonics Electric Mistress. Another pedal that Andy used a lot was an MXR Dynacomp. Along with the Electro Harmonics Electric Mistress, the compressor gives a consistent body to each note in the chords while the electric mistress is dialed to a chorus-like effect instead of the usual flanging sweep. His echoplex was normally set to a single repeat. You can hear this particularly on the song Walking on the Moon. In 1978, Andy acquired a Pete Cornish custom-built pedal board. It contained an MXR Dynacomp, an MXR Distortion Plus, MXR Phase 90, an MXR Analog Delay, and of course the electric mistress and Mutron pedals. I carry two Echoplexes on tour, both of which are about 15 years old. I combine the analog delay and the Echoplex to get some double rhythm effects. The board has a master effects on and off button, so you can pre-program effects together without having any effects on, then just hit one button and have them all come on together. During the police years, and he started using Fender Twins and then graduated up to Marshalls once he had the money. Andy played two 100 watt Marshall heads acquired in the late 1970s with two 4x12 Marshall speaker cabinets. And those amps were either Marshall JMP's 1959 Super Leads or 1992. Along with the Marshalls, Andy also used a Roland Bolt and Roland JC120 solid state amplifier and also had a Mesabuki amp in the system for solos. Andy's also done soundtracks for films such as Down and Out in Beverly Hills. There's always been something very artistic with 
the art and the playing of Andy Summers. He's never sort of rested on his laurels with the police fame. He's always, I think, tried to be innovative and really do something on the fringe of music. So what's really interesting me about Andy Summers is how he's reinvented himself almost every decade. And even to the point where now he is still combining world music influences and jazz and trying to create some new music styles. So guys, if you're thinking of the guitar sounds that were most identifiable with the 1980s, Andy Summers was really the instigator of all of that sound. We're talking delayed sounds, chorused, flanged and compressed. Even bands such as Def Leppard owe a lot of their hits to Andy Summers' really beautiful guitar playing. But guys, it's not all about pedals. Andy says about pedals, there will never be a replacement for talent or musicality. Pedals will give you the sounds, but they won't make the music for you. When you think of Andy Summers' guitar style, you think of shimmering tones with sus and add nine chords. And that was a huge part of the police's success. Thanks guys for watching this video. We've got a lot more to come, so stay tuned. See you in the next video. God bless.